Thank you. Thank you so very much. And uh, I will say once again, as I said on previous occasions, and I am not just saying it to be uh, saying something, uh, but because I truly mean it, that I am uh, always honored and happy and often downright overjoyed to be in Texas, to uh, uh, share in that unique keynote of uh, uh, American life that I have always found in Texas, and uh, uh, which of course has been uh, uh, in part influenced by uh, uh, the initiatory stream uh, uh, of Freemasonry and many others. And I'm always happy to be here with people who are uh, uh, good Americans, good, good patriots, and really good people. And I found the Texans to be that. And, I, and I, I'm very happy to be here with you. Now, um, as to our um, subject, um, as you are um, aware, although um, we will be talking about, about many things, the, the actual announced subject, I think, had to do with thoughts about the future of the esoteric tradition. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, uh, we humans are always eager to learn about the future. Many years ago, um, uh, we had a, a colorful character where we had, ma had many colorful characters and still do in California, who was the, uh, uh, the California uh, prophet Criswell. He had nationally syndicated uh, television show and uh, he was predicting. Very few of his predictions ever seemed to materialize, but he was very popular, maybe just because of that. Uh, uh, in any event, he would always start his program uh, with a particular little speech, and part of that was we are all interested in the future because that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. And then the music would come on, Chris Criswell predicts. So obviously the, uh, the interest in uh, the future is a, a frequent and legitimate one. But there is a circumstance that we probably don't um, often recognize. Um, and uh, uh, that is uh, the uh, uh, quite evident uh, fact that if we are interested in the future, and if we uh, hope to uh, gain, get some information about the future, and then be able to possibly um, uh, uh, work within circumstances as yet not uh, disclosed but uh, appearing in the future, then it is uh, even more important uh, um, to us to know something about the past. Because uh, on, the, on the time uh, scale of the on the timeline, it is quite obvious that the, the present arises from the past, and then again the future arises from the present. So the past, even, even in a purely chronological sense, is always present. But there is another um, uh, somewhat more profound and somewhat more esoteric reason, which appears among others in a passage in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, the most popular of the uh, Gnostic scriptures of Naj Hammadi, wherein, uh, uh, I will sort of slightly paraphrase it, wherein the disciples ask Jesus, tell us how our end will be. The end, of course, being the, the ultimate future. And he asks them, know ye then the beginning, so that ye inquire about the end? For where the beginning is, there shall be the end. And then he concludes by saying, blessed is the individual who uh, uh, stands at the beginning, for he will not taste death. This is slightly uh, paraphrased. 
So the indication here is that in the uh, beginning of uh, uh, various uh, events and circumstances uh, of our lives, uh, uh, there is uh, an indication of uh, the entire history of that development and the history of the future. And so um, I thought that when uh, uh, attempting to cast the gaze into the possible uh, future, especially of the tradition in which we are all interested in, uh, uh, it will be useful for us to recollect uh, how uh, it all began. By it all at this moment, I don't mean the, the creation of the world and things of that sort, but rather um, how uh, the esoteric tradition or the exoteric tradition came about. How did these um, primarily two divergent, although actually complementary approaches uh, came uh, to be? Uh, and in order to do that, we have to uh, uh, sort of mount a, uh, a little time machine and go back to uh, probably early periods of human history, although such uh, 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 events have occurred in, in throughout history also, and see um, uh, how um, spiritual uh, traditions come into being. And I think we are on a fairly uh, firm ground if we say that they always come to truly spiritual developments, truly spiritual movements, real spirituality, and indeed, I am not afraid to use the term religion, all start with one thing. And that one thing is experience. Uh, sometimes I felt like writing a kind of a little revision uh, of the uh, uh, poem to the Gospel of John, in the beginning was experience. And this is uh, undoubtedly true. So let us say at, in, in any, uh, at any time in history, but particularly in early periods, we have an individual or several who, uh, heaven knows uh, uh, under what circumstances, because the circumstances don't really matter that much but they have an experience, an experience that is out of this world, an experience of the other, uh, the experience of that which uh, is not present in the world at the time. Uh, and this, of course, is, uh, impresses them very greatly. Uh, and when they uh, come uh, back from the uh, a higher state of consciousness and converse with people whom they know. Uh, they try to convey to them what the nature of the experience was. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, they can only do so with a great deal of uh, difficulty. This is actually the beginning of uh, that much uh, uh, well, shall we say, that much derogated and controversial uh, subject of myth. Because what people experience in these uh, uh, truly high and transcendental states of mind, of consciousness, uh, cannot be expressed in ordinary human language. Uh, and it definitely cannot be expressed in uh, the kind of language that is prosaic, that is uh, fact-oriented, and it is what in psychology, uh, uh, after Jung, we call extroverted. Uh, uh, it cannot be expressed in that fashion. It, it usually can be expressed in a story, uh, in, in the form of story, in the form of, uh, in the form of poetry, uh, uh, in the form of uh, artistic expression, perhaps not only of the uh, poetic and verbal kind, 
but of other, um, other uh, aspects of uh, art as well. And uh, when they do so, uh, they uh, convey uh, not facts, not theories, uh, not um, uh, systems of uh, philosophy or, or uh, of any kind of other, at least in part, intellectual discipline, but they convey something that is conveyed more by a feeling toned expression than anything else. They bring back a, a, a fragrance of another world, of another reality. And that fragrance infuses their words. It enters their poetry. It uh, um, informs their, uh, their stories. And these are then remembered. They are not remembered because they are going to be uh, practically uh, um, important, not because people will be able to use them to make money or to obtain influence and power with people or things of that sort, but because they, they, feel, they feel different. They feel good. Uh, they feel uh, so that the heavy weight of human life, uh, of its uh, many, many uh, concerns and difficulties and foibles is temporarily lifted of their souls so that they are now at least for a period of time without that weight that moved in on, in on them probably pretty much at the time they were born and, weigh, and weighed them down ever since. And this is the beginning of spiritual traditions. So the original seer <coughs> or, or groups of uh, seers, the original knower or group of knowers, and that is of course the meaning of the Greek word gnostikos, uh, um, is uh, uh, stimulated. Gnosis is stimulated. Uh, people, uh, people begin to have a, a deep feeling that something marvelous, something holy order, something liberating, something truly, truly exciting can happen because it happened to their teacher, because it happened maybe to a minor degree to them. And then years go by and uh, uh, the story is passed on uh, verbally. <coughs> there is a there is, there is a verbal tradition, which as the generations pass, uh, becomes somewhat tenuous. <clears throat> and so when we are dealing with a historical period where uh, uh, the written word already exists, then uh, the, uh, uh, the, the remnants of the memory of that experience are now written down. And now we have the beginning of the sacred scripture, which when uh, it is uh, uh, investigated uh, uh, in depth, reveals itself as mythical, uh, because that is how it brings forth the, uh, the original experience. Then time goes on yet further, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the scripture uh, which contains the remnants of the original experience, now becomes a, a, a source of two kinds of inspiration. The first is belief. The second, actually three kinds of inspiration. Belief conjoined to um, um, law or uh, commandment. So people extrapolate from the, uh, uh, the traditional account of the original experience and its impact, they extrapolate from it uh, uh, the, the elements 
which will, uh, uh, which will tell them what to believe on the one hand and what to do and what not to do. Uh, and that is the beginning of the mainstream, sometimes called by the Greek word orthodox, truly believing the, the tradition, the tradition of belief. And probably from the beginning of time, a very large numbers of people, probably the majority of any uh, nation or any uh, uh, aggregate of people, then developed a religion along those lines. And as time goes on, uh, the uh, major portion of the religion now consists of belief, a, an ancient word for it is dogma, and of commandments. And the, the fragrance of the uh, or the world, the fragrance of the eternal, the, uh, the whisperings of Gnosis become gradually less and less. Or oh, it is still possible uh, for some truly uh, mystically talented souls to uh, work their way through uh, uh, the uh, dogmatic, and moralizing uh, uh, strictures and uh, pronouncements of the religious system and just maybe occasionally, most just maybe slightly, although occasionally, uh, meaning occasionally would be sometime, and at times we truly encounter those who are, are are, have such a strong soul that they penetrate to the source. And then behind these uh, rather uh, mundane uh, aspects of religion, they still touch that central core. These are the great saints, uh, the great devotees, and uh, um, gurus uh, of whatever we wish to call them, uh, uh, hierarchs and great lamas and so forth of the various religions. But for the most part, uh, the re religion now has become something that hardly deserves its name, if we think about it seriously. You know, um, the study of the origin of words, especially when one has some uh, knowledge of uh, ancient or modern uh, lang languages is often very informative. Religio means to rejoin, to join together. Uh, the same word as ligament. And so the original purpose of uh, religious spiritual traditions has always been to reconnect once again, not verbally, not intellectually, and not even by way of uh, um, uh, a common behavior, but in a mysterious other way to reconnect the uh, individual on the earth today with a mysterious but absolutely marvelous tran transforming uh, consciousness changing reality. And so we find, let's say, in uh, some of the uh, churches that by their time have become quite uh, uh, mired down in dogma and mired down in uh, picky commandments, we find great, great saints. We find great illumined souls. Uh, who have uh, managed to fight their way through the obstacles from the unreal to the real. Saint Teresa of Avila, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, Meister Eckhart, uh, uh, Johannes Tauler, all the great mystics of the Christian Church were of that order. 
they managed to break through the walls which their own religious tradition had erected around that holy of holies uh, from whence comes their own illumination. But they were always few in number. And sometimes, uh, or re really very often, the religious establishments would uh, uh, try to make up their minds. Uh, well, what should we do with this man or with this woman? Should we uh, start revering them as a great saintly person? Or uh, should we maybe burn them at the stake? And in some cases, they did both. Witness, witness St. Joan of Arc. First, she was uh, revered as a great inspired leader. Then she was burnt at the stake. And not very long time after, a few decades thereafter, she was declared a saint. So, you know, the, uh, the religious establishments uh, have a hard time with these people. Uh, and needless to say, St. John had a hard time with the religious establishment as well, you know. Uh, with Bishop Cochon, which in French means pig. Now, you know, I don't know, I, I would not consecrate a, a, a man, a bishop, whose name is pig. Uh, well, he could change his name after all, we can, we can do that. <laughs> uh, in any event, you know, and in other places too, there, there are all kinds of combinations and we don't need to go into them, but you certainly, for instance, there is, a, a, let's say, a, a historical Judaism is certainly known in addition to its innumerable virtues, uh, is also known for a great deal of legalism, commandment and then the interpretation of the commandment, then the interpretation of the interpretation of the commandment and all the rules and all the commandments and so forth. And yet, uh, here in a historical era, which was really, really difficult for that kind of work, there arose one of the, the most mystical movements of, uh, of uh, religious history, the movement of the Hasidim in Eastern Europe and in, in Poland. Uh, uh, started by Israel Ben, ben Eliezer, the, the master of the holy name, the Baal Shem Tov, and many, many other uh, you know, truly uh, inspired uh, mystical rabbis. And yet they, they managed to come out of a, of a, of a tradition that uh, is difficult. And then, of course, often they themselves were still there teaching and so forth, and the disciples already were making dogmas and were making rules, you know, because that's, that's how this sort of thing proceeds. So this is one stream. And then there is another, however, which uh, also arose, uh, arose from the first impulse, but that is the, the, the uh, uh, let's say, the the stream, the tradition, that the, uh, the members of which said, well, we want to have experience, just like our founders did. We want, to, we want a, a consciousness which is similar to that that maybe the apostles and the disciples had when they were in the presence of their master. We want to get to that same place to which the great sages and the great saints who started this tradition journey. And then they, they go about realizing that desire. And they usually will do all kinds of things that promise them that result. And eventually they get there. And then, uh, the, of course, they uh, are also in need of some way preserving these experiences just like before. And one of the ways that they can do that is that they, uh, uh, in addition to their experience, experience of the transcendental, they also find, uh, uh, they, uh, they, they find, uh, they discover uh, um, ways in which 
the, uh, their experience can be translated at least to some degree into uh, comprehensible terms. And this is what I think Peter referred to, Father Peter referred to just a few minutes ago against, which in Greek was called theoria. So there now, de now developed the two pillars of what became, what is becoming the esoteric tradition, like the two pillars of the Temple of Solomon, which are uh, known to you. And in fact, I saw uh, two of them right there, two, of, two representations of them right there, one of them covered by the, uh, uh, by the Lone Star flag of, uh, of Texas. Uh, so, uh, and these pillars are in, were in called uh, Theoria and Theurgia. Uh, theurgia is the mystical practice, the theurgy, that it is called the divine work, whereby the individual human rises to a supernal state of consciousness and actually manages, at least for a period of time, to transcend the limitations of earthly embodiment. Uh, that is the divine magic. Uh, how it is accomplished, or what, what may be involved, we'll talk about in a minute. But then people also uh, have, after all, still, uh, and that was very much recognized already in the ancient world, uh, uh, the people have uh, uh, portions of their being, portions of their personality, which are um, uh, of a non-mystical nature. We have a physical body, which is obviously concerned with its own physical needs and uh, desires and proclivities. We have an emotional nature, which is concerned with feeling, uh, so that when we experience something, usually by way of the physical senses, then we can evaluate it. Do I like this or not? And that is the feeling, feeling function. And then comes one that asks a very important question. Uh, what does it mean? If, if I, I had an experience with the physical or, 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 or mystical or otherwise, what, what, how can I find the meaning thereby? And that is the, the thinking function. And now comes, a, uh, uh, now comes a difficulty, because this is what you know, the ancients said, that there is, there is body and soul, and then there is spirit, soma and psyche. So the soma is the body, the psyche is the feeling and the thinking uh, uh, function, and now comes a great question, is there something else? And if so, can I deal with it? Can I get there? And now come the intimations of what in Greek is called the pneuma, in Latin the spiritus, the breath of transcendence, the breath of the holy order, something that is in itself not encountered in this world. And then we find certain uh, uh, ways of joining the uh, lesser nature of physicality, of uh, feeling, sentimentality, and intellectuality, and a little bridge is built. In classical antiquity, it was called the noose, which is the, uh, the uh, the joining link and is the function that links us with transcendence, with eternity, with the holy order. And when this, this is activated, then we touch something truly out of this world, and this is what has been called spirit. Totally different, the holy order. And yet, now here is the great paradox, which uh, is difficult to, uh, to uh, reconcile, the great paradox that there is something that is wholly other, 
something that truly transcends everything that we can cognize with the senses, that we can have a reaction to emotionally, that we uh, can try to evaluate intellectually, and yet it is there. It is there. But uh, the paradox is that it is not really somewhere else, but it is at least a portion of it. Just about enough for us is within us. It is, it is vast, it is endless. There is no uh, way of, uh, of coming to the end of it in, in consciousness. Uh, it, it, it has been uh, metaphorically characterized as a, as a great ocean, the ocean of spirit, as something uh, of such vast proportions uh, that uh, it, one cannot even attempt to describe it. And yet, that ocean is present in a little drop, <laughs> again, metaphorically speaking that is actually inside of us. Yet, very often that is the last place where we look for it. Uh, because we, uh, we have been taught, even by religion, to always address a, agencies and powers outside of ourselves. Gods, angels, so forth, and they are envisioned as being outside. How do these relate to that mystery that all mysticism recognizes as being within us, that St. Paul the Apostle referred to as the Christ in, in you, the ho your hope of glory? Huh? Uh, uh, the way it, the way it is, is reconciled is that somehow in the, uh, in the unthinkable mystery of existence, a small portion of the timeless, the eternal, the unthinkable, the unfeelable has also been embodied in us. And if we finally make the great turn from the outside to the inside, then we begin to have contact with it. And it inspires us and it helps us and most importantly, it transfigures us increasingly into its own likeness. This is an intellectual statement. That's the only one we can make. <laughs> we can't think with anything else but, but our minds. But this comes about as close as possible to a, a, a mental uh, image of the central core of the esoteric tradition. In practical terms, the esoteric tradition is neither more nor less, but the recognition and ultimately the, the practical involvement with the seed of transcendence, the center of the eternal and the endless that exists within us. Now, is this to say that it only exists within us? Of course not. Because as I indicated before, it's, it, it is vast and without any kind of boundary. And yet, thankfully, uh, and uh, uh, with, uh, with glory and with appreciation, we need, need to acknowledge that it is also here. Now, the trouble of uh, spirituality, the trouble of religion, and nowadays there are a lot of people who uh, say, and I think that most of them mean it, although these things become a kind of a trite slogan very often too, uh, uh, that they are not religious but that they are spiritual. Well, if they really knew what they are saying, and if what they are saying would truly be real, 
then that would be a wonderful thing. But of course, like, like so many of these things, they become shibboleths, they become slogans, they become a nice thing to say, whereby you avoid uh, going to church uh, and various other things. Uh, so um, it, would be, it would be a wonderful and great thing. Uh, but so that is the very center of the esoteric tradition. But of course, it, it requires something of us. Every kind of treasure, every kind of good thing, whatever it may be. Uh, I don't know, even uh, uh, why not make a little culinary metaphor? Even a really tasty, well-prepared dish requires something of us. Appreciation, smacking our lips, uh, telling other people about it. Oh dear, that, that, was, that was really a, a, an, a, an outstanding one. And thereby we establish a, a contact with the, with the object of our, uh, with the object whose virtues we are extolling. And of course, as we are further going up the scale, more and more of that sort of thing is, is important. <clears throat> uh, 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 there, there needs to be a recognition and there needs to be an, an appreciation. And uh, the, the great difficulty with the popular religiosity, whether in the East or in the West, uh, or the North or in the South, and if there are any, uh, any religions on uh, other planets or so, uh, uh, then there also, the great problem is that this central mystery, this all-important reality is forgotten about. And instead of that, it is projected. It says God is there in the, in the heavens. And the, it, it, his various uh, emanations and various servants, angels and so forth, they're all there. But it's not recognized that it is. It, it is there, but it is also here. And uh, that we need to attend to our own to the, to the divine in our own human household. And if we don't, then everything else is going to be suffering from a very, very bad, a very radical imperfection. Yeah. And so here we have the, the, how the great division came about and how it uh, continued. The exoteric is the one that works with the envisioning of the, the transcendental, of the holy order, uh, whatever we wish to call it, outside of us, and uh, worshiping it there. The esoteric recognizes its vital and all-important presence within us. Now, that doesn't mean that the esoteric cannot engage in, in uh, projection, but it does not uh, substitute a projection for the real, but continues with the, uh, with the, the Upanishadic saying from the unreal, lead me to the real. But uh, one of the great difficulties from a certain time on, from the time of the, uh, the uh, coming of the, zodiacally speaking, uh, of the Piscean age, the, ex the exoteric religiosity to a very large extent swallowed up everything else and then became uh, antagonistic toward the, toward the esoteric, uh, cast it out and uh, declared it uh, heretical. And this, is, this has been true uh, in many, many places. They have, you know, that even Buddhists uh, persecuted the Manichaeans who came to China. Well, because they don't believe like we do. You see. <laughs> uh, and moreover, uh, Although it, 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 it is right in the teachings of Buddha that every human has a Buddha nature 
and that it is that Buddha nature that needs to be cultivated and that ultimately will cause uh, enlightenment. So for all these many, many uh, uh, centuries, with some of, some of exceptions here and there, uh, the uh, exoteric became antagonistic to and repressed and ridiculed and in various ways uh, acted in a derogatory fashion toward the esoteric. By the way, the terms esoteric and exoteric uh, were, uh, were mostly publicized really they, they, in the 19th century, one being inner and the other one being, being outer with the 19th century spiritual developments of Madame Blavatsky and, and uh, various others. Uh, but the esoteric was always there. Um, uh, I, one one uh, nice expression for it is that, a uh, nice metaphor, that it was like an underground stream that runs uh, uh, below the surface of the earth and that um, periodically here and there, depending on the uh, uh, opportunities, breaks to the surface. And when these things happen, then we have, uh, well, in Christendom, we have the Gnostics right at the beginning. Later on, we have uh, various uh, other esoteric uh, uh, varieties of spirituality that appear for a while and make us cause a sort of a flash in history, but then usually are repressed again, except when uh, History moves in such a way that uh, religion no longer has the powers of the state at its disposal to uh, uh, not, uh, and therefore, ca therefore cannot practice that sort of repression. Now, uh, it has certainly not, it has not been that way, and I'll just throw that in because time passes with us. Uh, after a certain period, after thousands of years, the ancient Mediterranean uh, cultures and civilizations, which culminated really in Egypt, Greece, and Rome, but there were Babylon, Persia, uh, you know, uh, various, various others there too. The ancient Mediterranean spirituality, no doubt after uh, various internal battles, developed a nice system. And this was the system of the mysteries, which meant that while the majority of the people enjoyed their exoteric religion and they were sacrificing to uh, Zeus, Jupiter, or uh, uh, Aphrodite, Venus, because they are the same, you know, these divine archetypes. And I must admit that the ancient gods and goddesses, for the most part, if you study their activities and maybe you establish some contact with them, were a lot of fun. They were a lot more fun than the, than uh, uh, much much in Christian or much in any monotheistic religion, because in order to have uh, have uh, you know real uh, real exciting fun going on, you need several. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to have fun by yourself. That's why the monotheistic God is, uh, for the most part, so uh, sour, uh, so uh, uh, lacking in, in humor and lacking in, in fun. Uh, <clears throat> so they, 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 they had the great, beautiful, and, uh, and colorful um, festivals, uh, uh, ceremonies for the people who wish to do that. And then they had small, very intense, uh, very demanding, but ultimately very rewarding activities for those for that small number of people who wanted to, uh, wanted something deeper, who wanted something more. And these places were uh, that type of uh, uh, spiritual work was going on were the mysteries. We are quite familiar with the, we are familiar with their names, but very little of what they were doing because they were very secret. And some of us have even a, 
I think, a fairly justified notion that initiatory, uh, 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 initiatory associations in our culture, often going back quite a way, are the heirs of these mysteries. And maybe that beautiful golden eagle that is uh, above this stage and some other pictures and uh, artifacts that you may find around here are related to that. Uh, these symbols and the people who practice them are the heirs of the old mysteries. No doubt in a different way, but they are about all we have of that period, for which reason they are very precious, and for which reason I just love it when I can address some of these folk as my brother, and I hope they can do the same. Because it is there of, you know, no matter how imperfect, no matter how uh, suppressed and so forth, that the spirit of the mysteries lives on. It had, this sort of, and this was perfectly legal, not only legal, but this was fully established and, and uh, uh, supported by the states, the, the city-states in Greece, by the empire in Rome, by the pharaohs in Egypt, and so forth. There was no, no antagonism, antagonism toward the mysteries. With the coming of the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the situation changed. Uh, and that is when, they, uh, when in the esoteric tradition, at least within uh, the cultural matrix of the, uh, of the uh, Mediterranean region had to go uh, on the ground. Now, um, more or less with variations, uh, this situation of the two traditions the tradition of the vast majority and the tradition of the little minority, and often in an antagonistic relationship to each other, continued throughout the entire period of history that astrologically, because of the, uh, the precession of the equinoxes and all that sort of thing, uh, uh, is known as the, the Piscean Age. But, something is happening. And a lot of the things that are happening uh, are not very pleasant and not even very promising. But with, ming mingled with them, there are also promise, pro there is also a promise. Outwardly, if we like to have chronological boundaries, outwardly what is happening is that all the, ast all the astrologers and even some of the more fair-minded astronomers will tell you that uh, the um, Piscean Age is coming to a close. Maybe it has already. I know in the 60s a lot of, a lot of people thought that it had, and we had all the wonderful uh, songs of Aquarius, Aquarius, Aquarius. In Hollywood we even had an Aquarius theater. Uh, and theatrical establishment and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, a great, a great deal of uh, 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 expectant rejoicing or rejoicing expectation of the new age having come that is going to make everything nice, everything lovely. Uh, well, uh, it just uh, didn't work out that way. And one of the main reasons for that being chronologically, if you go by uh, the zodiacal ages, is that these statements were made much too early. But the early with the passage of time becomes now. And then the now, <laughs> if the now becomes the future. And this is sort of what I'm trying to allude to uh, tonight. It seems that with the gradual, and it's very gradual, because, you know, astrological and astronomical calculations uh, are uh, uh, in many, many years, and so a century to them is like, a, like five minutes to us. Uh, but uh, it would appear that uh, 
in the uh, period of history. These are, these are usually calculated, and this seems to be fairly valid. I don't think that this is uh, uh, what uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky uh, would, uh, uh, would call flapdoodle. Uh, I think that these, one can see the operation of these zodiacal ages, that as the zodiacal age moves into that of Aquarius, there is taking place a shift of what? Of spirituality. The shift might even be so powerful eventually, but when we say eventually, we mean many hundreds of years, uh, that the, two, uh, the twofoldness of uh, the, the two parallel traditions of the esoteric tradition and the exoteric tradition will diminish and maybe disappear. How, will, how can that happen? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, there was a, someone, someone who said that, that uh, uh, it's, to predict is very difficult, especially the future. Uh, uh, who, was, who is it who said was a sports figure? Yogi Berra, right, that great prophetic figure who should be really recognized. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, and it, that being the case, as we look uh, at the hmm, probably sort of the last uh, last hundred, the last hundred and fifty years, the signs were multiplying, and the and the predictions were multiplying. Uh, Madame Blavatsky, the, who I, whom I consider to have been probably the the most uh, prominent, the greatest uh, uh, representative and enunciator of the esoteric tradition in the 19th century. Uh, she wasn't in the, in the business of, of predicting very much. She was too smart for that. She knew that she, that she would be found to be wrong, wrong too often. But she said one thing that really stuck in my mind, and then I found an interesting corroboration of it in connection with uh, the man whom I consider to be the most prophetic figure over uh, the last uh, century and or so, namely C.G. Jung. Madame Blavatsky wrote in a letter, I, I, have, I have all the data on it, and the details really don't matter. She said that, she said that in the 20th century, and as the 20th century moves into the 21st, psychologists, you know, that word was hardly known in her days, and psychologists will be amazed at the changes in the minds, in the souls of a very large number of people. Hmm. Uh, and uh, indeed, so it might be and maybe even so it is. Various others made predictions, uh, and they all seem to converge on this period of time. Other great esotericists, uh, Dr. Rudolf Steiner, uh, made predictions to the effect that uh, a new age would come that would be uh, under the aegis of uh, the Archangel Michael, who was a somewhat different kind of archangel in, in Steiner's view than uh, uh, an, an angel in a stained glass window, although I certainly do put on, don't put down stained glass windows. Uh, mm. My good friend Peter Reardon is, uh, is a master of the same, and we even have some of his handiwork back in, 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 in Hollywood. Uh, but um, many others, the ma people of the magical tradition were quite uh, excited, and this, you know, comes out of ultimately of Eliphas, Levi, and Papus, and uh, 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 the Golden Dawn tradition, and so forth, uh, in the very early part of the 20th century, uh, as the century had moved into the 20th century, that the new aeon would start at that uh, particular time. But one thing is, uh, and then, or, and then, of course came uh, the, the truly 
impressive, at least to me, prophetic figure, whom I have uh, studied uh, quite intensively for many, many years. And as, uh, has, as uh, Peter announced, I, I had some, some little part in calling attention to his uh, esoteric and prophetic work at quite an early uh, time, because my book, The Gnostic Jung and the Seven Sermons to the Dead, uh, came out uh, uh, way uh, before uh, the Red Book and things of that sort in the early, really early, early 1960s, uh, C.G. Jung. Now, when we put all of these together and particularly explore the prediction of Jung, uh, Jung made no bones about it, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's all over his Red Book, which was originally intended by him to be a, a, a prophetic work. And then, of course, many other elements uh, entered into it, but the prophecy was still there, that the new ion, the ion of Aquarius, was coming, of course, it, it, it would be probably noticed about a uh, hundred to a hundred and fifty years uh, after he wrote uh, uh, about it in the original after 1916. So we are uh, now past the, the, the hundred year mark. And uh, the central issue with the new Aeon, as he called it, would be that the deity indwelling in the human soul, which is sometimes even referred to as the essence, the essence of the human would be increasingly recognized and would become the focus of the new religion of the new aeon. Now, obviously, if and when that should happen, uh, the, uh, there wouldn't be any need any longer for an esoteric tradition because its position would have become dominant. There can be still some details. So this is a very interesting uh, and very, uh, very valuable keynote and uh, prediction. Uh, we need to keep in mind that Jung made the prediction to uh, have three keynotes. It's in the it's in the Red Book and then repeated uh, again. And these are that the way the change of the new aeon would come. And he said three things, war, magic, and religion. And it seemed to most of us when studying the Red Book that these were uh, stages, one after the other. War first, magic second, and religion later. But uh, increasingly, at least uh, in, in my mind, uh, the idea has formed that to, at least to a considerable extent, the three could be happening at the same time. Uh, oh, it is quite obvious to me that the prediction about war is not the prediction that had to do with World War I or World War II or with Hiroshima or anything of that sort, but that to a, although that probably plays a role, but that the new aeon would contain, at least initially, a very powerful keynote of a warfare of souls. And uh, I would say that one would have to be really spiritually and perhaps even intellectually impaired uh, not to realize that this warfare of souls is going on in our world, is going on in our culture, and that is of a, it, it is of a very powerful and very disturbing nature. Uh, so, uh, the forces in humanity are clashing with each other. The, the, the souls are uh, uh, finding fault with each other, 
and they, they are not finding a common ground. As you noticed in so many respects, it's of course most glaring in the noisiest area, which is politics, <laughs> you know, that there is, uh, people don't recognize a common ground. Uh, we, um, uh, we need to uh, be against each other, we need to form groupings on usually on the basis of superficialities and then go against each other in all sorts of ways who knows eventually perhaps even by by bloody warfare or things of that sort uh, so it is it is a very difficult period in that respect at the same time probably at the same time, or perhaps succeeding it a little bit, there is what Jung, Jung refers to, there would be magic. And that magic is much more, as he put it, is much more secret. It is much more subdued outwardly than the war. But the magic would come, and by implication one can see in Jung's prediction that the magic would help to transform, because that is what magic is about. <laughs> it, is the, it is inducing changes from within outwards. Mother, one of the, Madame Blavatsky's saying was that uh, the universe is governed and changed from within outwards. Uh, and therefore, uh, a a magical atmosphere would arise. You know, this can have, you know, this already has many implications, and f unfortunately, they are probably not the most spiritual ones. Don't you think that the electronic age is, is, is magic? Only a few years ago, if, we, if somebody had told us the kind of things that would be going on with all of these electronic uh, devices and situations, uh, I would have said to them that they are uh, touched in the head. Uh, and now uh, I am the one who is, who is maybe regarded as touched in the head because in, in my advanced age and in my being steeped in various other largely esoteric disciplines, I, I, I can't keep up with it. You know, I have... Uh, I don't even know where on, the, where on the internet I'm speaking because I gave that speech earlier and it's just out there. So it is a, a yet we are in we are in a magical uh, age, uh, except the uh, the ways in which we tend to account for that magic now are in a, in a different mindset, in a different terminology, in a different language. But I'm certain that if some of you little magic squares that you always look into, and sometimes they masquerade as a telephone, and sometimes they masquerade as a, uh, as a, a camera, uh, you know, Dear Christopher Isherwood, God rest his soul, when he wrote his Berlin Diaries and they made a movie out of it first called I Am a Camera, uh, then, it, then it became Cabaret later on as a musical. If, if people had told him what kind of cameras people are going to become, it's not that they just use them, but they are becoming cameras, uh, he, he, would have, he would have walked away from Hollywood. Uh, in any event, you know, and then he says, magic, and war, magic, and religion. And so that the culmination of this process, but also occurring probably simultaneously with that somehow, that, that, that internal reality, that, uh, that point that links us with transcendence uh, will be discovered and will become a very important element or center in the religious picture. Now, um, this is to be hoped for. But let me uh, insert here also before concluding a bit of a warning. The way these, these developments occur in history are manifold. And, uh, I am concerned, I am greatly concerned 
with some of the signs of the changes in the on the spiritual intellectual scene that I am beginning to see. Because there seems to be on a fairly large uh, um, scale a uh, total uh, abrogation, a total uh, getting away from the tradition from the traditional religious symbols and maxims of the culture. And as yet, I see nothing appropriate taking their place. And so I think that those of us of the esoteric tradition should pay attention to this and perhaps uh, remember in our own minds and bring to the attention of others that a, a good deal, certainly not all, maybe not even half, but still a good deal of the content of the, uh, let's, the Judeo-Christian Islamic matrix of religions uh, contains great and valuable esoteric truths which perhaps up to now were only seldom recognized, but which we are still there. Uh, I think Chesterton said that when people cease to believe in God, uh, then they don't believe in nothing. Because one cannot believe in nothing. <laughs> then, they, then they don't believe in nothing, but they'll believe in anything. Now, I'm a, I'm a viejo, you know. I've been around for a long time. I've, even though I was quite young, but I, my eyes and ears were open and I had parents who were very communicative with me. I lived under the Nazis. I lived under the communists. And both of them were absolutely horrible. And both of them were false, malign, uh, malicious, evil pseudo-religions, which took the place of real religions. So let us not be too quick in condemning the exoteric tradition and its religiosity. In it, there was still always much valuable. And it, it more often than not, uh, it practically always, it acted as the foundation for entering into the esoteric tradition. I've known many people with esoteric interests, as you do, and uh, what is it now, you know, over, over 60 some years, uh, a member of the Theosophical Society, where well, sort of things you are, have been around. Uh, but I have never met uh, uh, an esotericist who did not have some measure, some modicum of exoteric background upon which the esoteric could be built, especially in terms of values, uh, of what is good and what is bad, because a Value, value systems in history have inevitably claimed a, a supernatural and a divine origin. Whether it's the gods or whether it's the, the, the great disciples of the gods, like in India, the rishis who wrote the Vedas uh, or uh, 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 others, uh, they were all people who were connected with the religion were connected with the divine. And they, they, they claimed a, a deific reason, a transcendental rationale for some of the basic human values whereby people in a human society have lived. If that is pulled out, uh, like a, a, a malign uh, flying carpet, if that is pulled out from underneath our humanity now, 
there will be nothing to build on. The stairway that may lead to the internal God will be so damaged that we won't be able to climb up on it. So we have to be very careful. Don't throw out, uh, I'm tempted to make a sort of a pun, don't throw out the, the baby Jesus with the bathwater, because undoubtedly he also took some baths. Uh, after all, he was, he was a very clean, clean figure. Because if we get to the point in large numbers of people where we have done away with what was, and we have not as yet discovered even a modicum of what shall be, we are going to be in a terrible, terrible shape. And uh, this needs to be considered. How to consider it? Well, I'm, cons I'm considering it now by talking about it. But the most important thing is that we, uh, we, si we, we sift the, the wheat from the chaff. We can dispense with the dogmas, di di dispense with the uncalled for legal legalism, but keep it within uh, uh, valid bounds. Because if we throw everything else, then we will have nothing. And you may be assured, if you may be assured that elements will move into the minds, into the culture which will be vastly inferior to what has been and which uh, is not going to redound either to the benefit of the individual or of the culture. I could, I could quote to you pages from people like Joseph Campbell, uh, uh, from Jung, uh, from you know, some of the uh, really, I would say, very insightful people of our culture to that effect. So some, this needs to be kept in mind. So that is, the, uh, uh, that is the dark concern that I have. And if I did not voice it, I think uh, I would be remiss. But fortunately, as this always is in life, because, of, because Mani of, of Persia was right, there is always a duality. The duality is in us, the duality is in the world. Uh, there is also a good news. Now, the good news has been with us all along, but very few people heard it, and even fewer appreciated it. And that is the good news, that beyond the confusion, beyond the war, and possibly beyond the lower, lower form of, of the, forms of the magic of this world, there is something there that is absolutely and tremendously and overwhelmingly wonderful and glorious and inspiring and loving and uh, promising. It is there. And if we make no contact with it, or if we are not open enough that it may make contact with us, that is a very, very terrible and a very regrettable circumstance. We are connected with something so, uh, so tremendous, so astonishingly wonderful, so unbelievably glorious and tremendous and joyous <laughs> and, and happiness producing and happiness in, uh, inspiring, that if we just touch its garment, if we just ga gain a little, uh, a little uh, glimpse of its light, everything will be wonderful. And whether we are still on this earth or elsewhere, we will be in uh, our true place. Because this is the, the theoria, which of course always has its, uh, its difficulties, that we, our true selfhood, has come from a condition. 
and was always tempted to say a praise, where it was at one with the central and ultimate core of being. And it brought some of that with it. Madame Blavatsky in her Stantas of John in The Secret Doctrine speaks of a great flame, a great, a great uh, conflagration uh, in the spirit, which is the fire of the spirit. And then out of that great flame, like, like a campfire, little sparks fly forth and fall into the darkness. Uh, those little sparks, she said, are you and I. But then the voice of the flame comes and, it, and spoke the flame to the spark. Thou art myself. I have closed myself in thee. And, and I'm adding to that sentence to, to it. And, and thou must return fully and consciously to me. This was the center of always the esoteric tradition. This was the insight of the sages and the saints and the enlightened ones and the transformed ones, and it still is. And it has to become our recognition. It has to become our realization and the conviction following on that realization. And if that can happen in us, then as the, uh, the, the somewhat forceful biblical saying has, the, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And they will not prevail against humanity because humanity is not just humanity, but humanity is, is, is div divinity in potential. Divi it is divinity in be beginning to manifest. And we are all gods and goddesses in exile. And with our uh, readiness, our effort, our devotion, and the, uh, the gracious help received from our source, we will not fail, but we will have, we will have fulfilled the cycle of the aeons and we will have come to a point where to use a very, uh, a very uh, uh, trite word, we will say, I am home, I am home, I am home, and we shall be, with, with the help of all the great ones, we shall be, and that is what is going to happen. Thank you very much.